Okay, like I was saying, uh, my name is Clifford Chua. I'm the managing editor for the Earth and Environmental Science section for SN Applied Sciences. I'm gonna be chairing the meeting today. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Julian Hunt, who is a research fellow at uh, the International Institute for Applied System Analysis. Yasa, at Yasa, he is part of the Energy, Climate and Environment Program, where his research actually focuses on implementing daily and seasonal energy storage technology in the message model and analyzing the output of this model to assess the impact of these different technology on long-term energy planning. He's also a visiting professor in the postgraduate program uh, of mechanical engineering at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Before joining YASA, he worked at the Energy and Climate Change Branch of the United Nations Industrial Development, Pro, uh, Development Organization. He holds a PhD in engineering sciences from the University of Oxford. Before I hand over the session to Dr. Hunt, I would like to ask all our participants to kindly switch off their video and mute themselves so as to give him the opportunity to present his work without interruption. If you have any question, please, you can type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself at the end of his presentation and ask your question. Then he will be able to respond accordingly. Without any further delay, I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Hunt. Dr. Hunt, you can take over the session. Thanks a lot, Clifford. Uh, thanks a lot for everyone that is interested in the paper. The paper, uh, the presentation talks about cooling down the world's ocean and the earth by enhancing the North Atlantic Ocean Current. It's the first time this is proposed, to my knowledge. Uh, there was some uh, research in, in the Soviet Union talking about the impacts of diverging um, ocean, uh, Siberian rivers to Central Asia and these impacts of cooling down the earth were already discussed. Um, yeah, but I'm kind of bringing it back, this discussion. Yeah, so Andreas Nascimento, Fabio Joana, Natalia Weber, Gabriel Castro, Ana Chavez, André Mesquita, Angeli Cooling, and Paulo Snyder also authored the paper. So this paper talks about geoengineering, which is uh, which is the act of building solutions, projects in order to change the climate. There are several proposals for this. Uh, for example, there are people that want that propose to send particles to the stratosphere, sulfite or different particles in order to increase the reflection of sun rays back to space. So that comes out. this is the most, most important, most relevant geoengineering solution, which supposedly has a, the least impact and is the least costly solution. There are several other ones and some of them are in the Arctic. So I'm showing you one proposal, which is to produce, increase the ice cover of the Arctic Ocean, which is the opposite what I'm proposing. And yeah, so this, this proposal for increasing the, the ice sheet of the Arctic, it has, it's a little bit complicated because once you, once you increase the melting uh, increase the ice cover, you increase the temperature of the Arctic, which will then melt the ice that you created quicker. And this proposal here of pumping water <clears throat> so that it freezes, it's not uh, so easy to implement because of course you increase the temperature of the Arctic, then the you might cre create ice in the location where you're producing ice, but then you can increase the melting in another location. There are several different ones. The one that I propose is basically to remove the ice cover of the, the Arctic. So in other words, uh, yes, the Arctic during the, the, during the winter has a huge cover of ice that, that reaches most of the 
North Pole during the winter and then the Ar and then in the summer, some of this ice melts, but not all of it. So the proposal is to remove all the ice even through the winter. So during the summer, during the winter, no ice. And I'm proposing some solutions on how this could be possible. And why would you want to do this? The idea is to extract heat from the oceans, which is uh, maintain warm because of this ice cover. So the ice cover of the Arctic work as a sheet that keeps the warmth, the heat of the oceans within the ocean. It's, it has a very strong insulation capacity, this ice cover, which allows the temperature of the Arctic Ocean the atmosphere of the Arctic Ocean above the Arctic Ocean to be minus 20, minus 40, it can reach up to minus 60 degrees. But if you don't have the cover, the temperature will vary from minus five degrees to 20 degrees. And increasing this amount of heat to the Arctic, what happens is that the amount of heat being radiated into space because you increase the temperature of the atmosphere will be higher than the amount of heat reflected by the long, long waves. So by the, because of the albedo effect. Yeah, so most people say, yeah, if, if, if the Arctic Ocean melts, what happens is that the earth will warm up because you, you absorb more solar rays into the ocean. Yes, this is, is, this is true, but comparing some results from models today, give the, the reflection of, of the long waves coming into the ocean will reduce because there'll be more waves being absorbed, but the short waves will increase. So sh short, short waves is the, the, the irradiation from the heat. So, the ocean heats up and then irradiates more temperature out. And some researchers already show that because of the melting, what happens that the balance, the heat balance of the Arctic is starting to become positive. In other words, there is more heat coming out of the Arctic than coming in in a yearly basis, which shows that, yes, of course, melting the Arctic sheet will increase the temperature of, of the Arctic pole of all this region. Russia, Canada will melt a lot of the Greenland, Greenland ice sheets, but you will have, will cool down the earth, will cool down the oceans. But of course, it cooling down the ocean will take a long time, but you have, um, the balance will will be that it will be more energy coming out of the earth with all the ice sheets than coming in. And in the paper, I have a simple uh, calculations. I made some simple calculations, which show this is the pre-industrial pre temperature of the Arctic Ocean. This is the temperature where the equilibrium is reached. In other words, that if you have uh, the ice cover like we have today, for example. This is similar to what we have today. So what we have today is that it doesn't cool down or it doesn't heat up, it's an equilibrium, the Arctic. But if we focus our, our efforts to remove even more the ice, so we put effort to extracting all the ice existing in the, in the northern, uh, in the Arctic Ocean, what happened is that given that the ocean will be much hot, much warmer than it is today, we will start cooling down the earth. We'll, we'll switch the equilibrium into cooling down. So the, the Arctic Ocean will work as, a, as a, a cooling source for the earth. And then what, what's the reason? Why is the Arctic Ocean frozen anyway? So the Arctic Ocean is frozen because here's the Atlantic Ocean here is the Arctic Ocean waters. And this is, this is a cross-section, is data for temperature at this cross-section. And what you have is, here is the salinity of the water at different depths. And here is the temperature of water at different depths. 
And in this location, which is the Arctic Ocean, you have very low salinity. And this low salinity is due to the melting of Greenland, the rain that precipitates in Canada and Russia, the flows into the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean, there is not so much evaporation because you have a layer of ice on the top, which avoids evaporation. But when it rains, the, the water enters the Arctic Ocean, reducing the salinity. So this is very, it's not fresh water, but the salinity is 30 grams of salt per liter. It's five grams lower than the rest of the ocean and significantly lower than the North Atlantic Ocean current. So what happens that given that the salinity is lower, the density will be lower. So then it's, it's floating on the surface and it doesn't mix with the warm oceans from the North Atlantic current. And you have a very clear barrier here, which impedes the North Atlantic Ocean to just literally take over the Arctic Ocean. This is this is an um, existing layer. This is data uh, from ocean, which I, I plotted this, I created this graph. And it's very clear to see, to show that the warmer ocean, Atlantic Ocean does not enter, this is the average temperature for, for the Arctic in a year, it does not enter the Arctic Ocean because of this salinity, lower salinity. And just by doing some maths, some physics, we have that comparing the density of, of seawater, two degrees of, of increase in temperature is equivalent to one gram per liter reduction in, in uh, seawater. In other words, if you, if you increase the salinity in one degree, that, that, that's equivalent to warming up the water to two degrees. So if you reduce the salinity to, so, so if you increase the salinity to five, five grams per liter is equivalent as your water warming up 10 degrees. So if you, if you increase the salinity in here, what's happening is just literally all this warm water from the Atlantic Ocean will, will enter and will probably flow to the Pacific water from the Atlantic Ocean. So how, how are we gonna do this? How is how this paper proposes to remove this uh, to increase the salinity of the sub, su super surface of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, yeah, so this paper created a, uh, a mass balance in salt water, fresh water, salt water balance of the Arctic. And you have several uh, flows of water and salinity. So you have water coming from these basins in, in Russia. You have water coming from these basins in Canada. You have melted water from Greenland, reducing the salinity of the Arctic Ocean. You have no evaporation because of the ice sheet. So if you don't have evaporation, what happens is that it, you, you, you don't allow the, the sun rays to evaporate water so that, but of course, when it rains, it increases the salinity. So these blue lines, they show vectors of reducing the salinity. When it rains, the flows, and these red lines, they, they show the vectors of increasing the salinity of the Arctic, which is mixing water, which is internal mix, mixing. So for example, when you have no ice, what happens is that the wind will blow, and then the, this wind will mix the water within the column if you don't have the, the ice, if you have the ice, the wind is not going to contribute to mixing the different layers. So of course, if you remove this, what happens is that you'll be very difficult to, to put the ice back again in the winter, for example. So working with these different balances, I have the equations, balance equations, a lot of assumptions, and then we work with the proposals. So the proposals for reducing the Arctic for increasing the superficial Arctic salinity is to diverge these rivers, the water from the, the basins from Canada and, and Russia, 
And the idea is that, well, this, this could be a proposal which is easily accepted because the demand for water in these regions is small. However, the demand for water in the US, in Mexico is, is significantly high. There are several projects already proposed for doing this in the US. Unfortunately, it didn't, didn't work. From Russia to Central Asia, to Europe, to China, also there's large demand for water. So it will be, there won't be so many people opposing this, of course, you have to build dams, you have to build pumps, you have to, it's very expensive, you have impacts by building these pumps. And of course, there will be some uh, problems with that. You have to make sure that everything is environmentally friendly and with small impacts. But this is one of the proposals. The other proposal is to build barriers in front of Greenland's ice sheets. The idea is to reduce the contact for, of warm, warm ocean waters to these glaciers and then reduce the melting of the glaciers. This proposal actually has, has been firstly proposed by Professor Moore. I, have, I was actually working parallel with him, but he published first this proposal and the idea is to build a dam. He proposed a dam, I proposed a floating barrier Floating barrier is easier because during the winter when it's very cold, you can just assemble on the top of the ice sheet. And then when it melts during the summer, you just uh, create, attach this barrier to an anchors and you have to have, of course, floating sections in order to maintain this barrier standing and strong enough to contain the mixture of cold fresh water with salty cold warm water from, from, from the Arctic. And then the idea is that if you do this, of course, one, one advantage is that you will also increase the temperature of the Arctic, which increasing the temperature of the Arctic will make it even, even easier for the sea, uh, for the water from the North Atlantic Ocean to mix with the Arctic Ocean. And you also reduce increase the salinity of, of the Arctic Ocean. So two huge benefits. The other benefit is that you also reduce sea level rise because this melting of, of Greenland glaciers has a huge impact on sea level rise. So this is a, another very big, very strong um, alternative. And the other alternative, which is a more simple more simple, more practical solution is just, just to catch water from, from the surface. So fresh water from the surface of the Arctic Ocean and pump it to the, to the deep ocean, the deep Arctic Ocean. And uh, what, what happens is that this salinity will dissipate, will mix with the deep Arctic Ocean, it's not going to go back. So, so the, the water with low salinity will not come back, will come back as a mixture. And then eventually you manage to remove this superficial lower salinity layer of the Arctic, and then which will allow the North Atlantic Ocean to take over the Arctic. And then the results, the results are basically uh, applying these mass balances and these proposals and it turns out that if you apply the two solutions, which are uh, reducing the flow of water and reducing the, the, the melted water from Greenland, it would take 50 years in order to not have a cold uh, ice sheet during the, during the winter in the Arctic. If you, on the other hand, have solutions for pumping water, so this is the mixture, mixing water from the surface to the bottom, you add that, that will take 25 years not to have ice in the Arctic during the winter. That's the goal of this paper. As crazy as it sounds, that's the goal of this paper. So looking at different proposals, uh, diverging the river flows of McKinsey, Ob. Winisei and Lena, each of them have different costs because some of them are more uh, flat 
terrain. Some have to reach very high altitudes in order to tr uh, transpose water down to the south. So each of them have different difficulties. Of course, Greenland ice sheet is also not so easy, but this these ships, which can be run with nuclear energy or maybe wind power, uh, have are, are, are the simple solution because you just need the ship there pumping water. So comparing all these, the amount of energy required in order to implement this is something like 120 gigawatts, which is compared to the installed capacity of Brazil that we have in Brazil. So applying this for 25 years would remove the, uh, the ice, the ice cover of the Arctic. And there are several impacts on the world climate. Of course, I mean, the Siberia is not going to be cold anymore. It's gonna be warm. Probably what happens that these <clears throat> cells that we are used to, the hyalocline, the, the, the Arctic pole cycle, the jet stream, jet stream is going to be much weaker. You have different uh, circulations, which will probably cause droughts. In most of the US, Europe, some of the Siberia, it will rain much more in the Arctic Ocean because the, the, uh, the warmth of the Arctic Ocean will push water up in the Arctic, which now is the opposite. Now the, the air goes down in the Arctic, but if you remove the ice, it will go up. So you rain more in the Arctic, we're rain less. On Canada on Russia, you have several other impacts. You have, of course, increased 20 to 30 degrees in average, the temperature of the Arctic Pole, but you cool down the oceans. But of course, in order for this impact on the, on the cooling down the ocean would take hundreds and thousands of years to be felt on the, other, on the rest of the world because you, you still have 700 meters of warm water ocean to be cooled. So it's very debatable, some advantages, several disadvantages, but this is just a proposal. And thank you so much for, for your time, please. I'm open for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, just one minute. Yes. I have a question. And uh, my question is actually, uh, Taking into consideration that this kind of project is more likely to have serious consequences on marine and aquatic uh, uh, habitat and life. Did you actually have thought about if these climate benefits actually outweigh uh, the impact on marine and aquatic life? Thanks, Clifford. Yeah, uh, there's a huge impact on aquatic life. The, there will be several species being extinct, yeah. Uh, yes, but of course there will be different other animals being replaced. This would take like 50, 30 years, 100 years. So in order to have a ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem might take a thousand years. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you this, but this is already happening. This is exactly what I'm proposing here in this paper is already happening. So it's not, it's not that it's gonna be different. So it will be extinct a lot of animals anyway. There will be a, it will take thousands of years to be, have a healthy balanced ecosystems anyway. So yes, yeah, so of course, what, what I'm proposing is to speed up and make it much quicker, the, the shifting. But this is already going to happen. So there will be several extinctions. There will be different animal species colonizing this area. There will be different fish, different animals, different birds. It's just going to change completely the ecosystem of the Arctic. Yeah, I think somebody also uh, asked a similar question in the chat. Uh, uh, I think so. And then uh, before I start reading the question in the chat, uh, if you actually look at uh, the timeline to actually see the, the impact of such a measure, it's much longer, um, you know, uh, 
do you think it would be really attractive for policymakers to kind of adopt this this kind of suggestion? Because climate change is very yeah, urgent. For example, Russia. Russia will be very interested because the Siberia will will not be frozen, so they can use it for planting soybeans. They will have all the infrastructure for using the water from the rivers to irrigate. Even if it doesn't rain, they can pump water. I mean, there is there will be enough water for them to to use the area. <clears throat> if one rich, uh, influential Russian wants to build a nuclear ship, they can build five, ten nuclear ship with five gigawatts install capacity and start pumping water from the deep ocean. And if other countries are not very happy with this, uh, I don't know what can do or what they can do, but they will have a huge impact on the climate. Yes. And if, if they decide to, for example, start shifting the water from Russia rivers, it will also have a huge impact on this North Atlantic Ocean current. Uh, if people start deciding to build barriers in front of Greenland, what happens is that all the ice is going to be gone from the Ar Arctic and, and all this that I'm proposing here is going to happen. And if we don't do anything anyway, this is going to happen, but it might take a thousand years instead of 20 or 50. Yes. Uh, I think there's another question in the chat from Mari Bear uh, Garcia. He, uh, I think the question is, climate change is already creating the condition for ice-free Arctic. So why is it important to speed this process up? Did you yes, get my... Yeah, it's a good question. Well, there are, there are benefits, there are the advantages. For example, um, Europe is going to be much warmer, so there will be no much demand for, for heating. People might not want to be interested to, to travel to Spain because they will, they will feel the heat in, in England, for example. The, uh, the Gulf currents, is going to be much stronger because it's going to reach much further. So the temperature of, of the ocean in front of Europe is going to be higher. Uh, because you cool down the earth, you probably control sea level rise, even though heating up the Arctic will melt more the superficial uh, surface of Greenland, cooling down the ocean will, will reduce the density of the ocean waters which will contribute for lowering sea levels. Uh, maybe for example, Russia wants to have a free ice sea ocean in order to ship goods. Maybe Canada wants also, but they have another ocean so that people can use for trade. Uh, lowering, so increasing the temperature of the Arctic will also reduce the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean which will mix both, both you having a uh, higher mixture of Arctic Ocean with Atlantic Ocean, Arctic Ocean, temperature waters, you will increase the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean, which will reduce the incidence of hurricanes in, in the US, in Central Asia. Um, it will make the both clouds more mild you will have less, you, don't, you won't have the jet stream, for example. The jet stream will disappear, disappear. So maybe it will be easier for you to predict the climate. But of course, that will take a long time, maybe 100, 200 years in order for the climate to be able to, to, be able to, be predict, to predict the climate. Because it's very difficult to know exactly how the climate will behave in if you remove the ice. Yeah. Clifford, yeah. What, 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 don't you think it's better if people ask questions like? Yeah, they can unmute, unmute themselves. I said it uh, in my introduction and ask, but I still have like two questions in the chat box. Uh, maybe I'll go through that. And if any other uh, party want to ask a question, they can just unmute themselves and ask. Then. Uh, Another question, this is from Dennis. The advantages seem interesting, but the disadvantages slide only remain on the screen less than is, uh, one second. Could, you, could we see it with more detail? Uh, maybe you can share your slide on the disadvantage. 
okay. again and yeah yeah i i wrote this paper like uh two years ago and i really haven't worked on this since then it's just kind of an idea that i had in when i was doing my phd but uh i'm not proposing this you know this is a this is a paper which is talking about possibilities right and it is good also to talk about this because there is a lot of research about the AMOC, about the North Atlantic Ocean Current, which is very confusing and not very clear. And, and I, I read it and I don't get anything. And there's a lot of misinformation about this topic. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of not very clear directions. So by proposing solutions, it, it, it becomes clearer to see like what's what's the trend? What's going to happen in the Arctic? You know, so I think this paper is also good to to you know clarify the the North Atlantic Ocean impact on the Arctic, the Arctic climate impact on the North Atlantic Ocean, and and so on. So the advantages: considerable increase in permafrost thawing, which will have devastating impacts on Canada Russian landscape and contribute to increased methane emissions. However, this paper, paper assumes that permafrost thawing would happen even if this project doesn't go ahead due to global warming. Second disadvantage is that changes in temperature in the world atmosphere would happen fast and then expected, particularly in the Arctic region, which would increase the number of droughts and floods. The polar weather cell would change direction, which with the melting of the Arctic ice during the winter, this will become, this is because the air temperature in the North Pole would be higher than the temperature in the, in Canada and Russia, thus the air would rise in the North Pole and descend in Canada and Russia. The feral cell might disappear. The North, Northern hemisphere and the polar cell will be directly in, 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 in contact with the Hadley cell in the winter in the northern hemisphere this would likely result in an increase in rain in the arctic region and have extensive impact in on the weather of europe america and asia it's however difficult to predict the impact of these changes the arctic sea ice loss might not only warm the atmosphere of the arctic but also cause many global warming, the large increase in temperature in the Arctic could result in melting Greenland ice from its surface, even considering that submerged barriers are implemented. Potential impacts on habitats of Ar Arctic animals such as polar bears, seals, fish, plants, bacteria and others. However, if climate change is not addressed, this, there is potential for many other species extinguished to extinguish around the world. The cooling of the ocean will happen from the bottom of the ocean until it reaches the surface. It might take thousands of years for the effect of cooling to be realized in the world's atmosphere. Yeah, of course, because this solution will warm up the Arctic a lot. And the, the cooling is gonna happen from the bottom of the ocean up. So it's not really a solution for global warming as the, the, the title says, the title is a bit misleading, I would say. Yes, I have one other question uh, regarding extreme events such as hurricane and wildfire. Would there be an impact on the frequency, you think? Yeah, exactly. So cooling, cooling down the Arctic Ocean, uh, cooling down the Atlantic Ocean by mix, improving the mixture with Arctic Ocean will will reduce the likelihood of hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. Probably not, it won't impact so much the Pacific Ocean because the, the mixture of water from, from the Pacific to the Arctic is small. Now it goes from Pacific to the, to the Arctic. Probably, I don't know if it will change, if it will, if it will flow to the other direction, I'm not sure. It's very difficult to, to predict how, how that will impact. 
Yes, uh, I think this another remark uh, uh, with regards to that we are still learning about climate change and how it affects the more. Uh, I think this is Moritana of us. Oscillation. I think this is something to do with uh, the circulation. If it should, come, yeah. So that is why there is a clear answer. Uh, oh, sorry. Somebody type. Me. Yeah, that was the right thing. Sorry. Overturning circulation. I forgot that. So that is why there is isn't a clear answer yet. So I think it's difficult to predict how this kind of geoengineering technique will really impact uh, this circulation on the ocean current. Maybe you can uh, touch a little bit on that. I agree, I agree. I agree, but it's just it just kind of like, it's interesting to see the, the main impact sources. So if it rains a lot in, in Russia, what happens is that the salinity of the Arctic increases, it reduces, I'm sorry, reduces and then re and, and then what happens that the AMOC weakens why because the salinity reducing here which it reduces the amount of flow coming from the north atlantic ocean so then it reduces and then you have colder winters in europe you have uh, for example more ice melting in greenland if you have a, a summer that melts a lot of ice water in in greenland what happens that the salinity of the arctic uh, reduces, the temperature reduces, so that the AMOC also reduces. So they have less water mixing from the Atlantic Ocean. The other one is, is the mixture of water. So the least, the less ice that you have in the Arctic, the more the wind will mix. The more the wind mixing, the more salinity, the salinity increases, which increases the, the strength of the AMOC. So the more water from the Atlantic Ocean enters the Arctic. So there are several papers talking about this. Some papers talk about the opposites. They give different uh, conclusions, complete, completely misleading conclusions. It's very simple. It's, 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 it's physics, it's density, it's water density, it's a, the temperature and salinity. And it's not very complicated to, to understand, but it's very important to, to have these uh, these these phenomena very clear for people to predict how how the climate of, of, of Europe is going to to be affected and and predict the climate in the future and and maybe even you know think twice before doing anything in the Arctic because it has a huge impact just a little bit uh, small changes that you make there have huge overarching impacts on the whole, whole world. Climate change, for example. Yeah, I think there's also another remark from uh, Andreas. Uh, I think maybe you can read, read that. Uh, so that I'll just go to the next question. He's talking about important conceptualization and also the advantages and disadvantages in regards to the idea presented. And he understands some of the difficulties of the data and consequences. So maybe you, 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 can, you can read that. Uh, and then I will just go to the next question from Dennis. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be possible to let the Arctic Ocean remain free of ice for part of the winter with the benefit you propose? And then for some weeks, let the ice should be, I think, uh, let the ice should be generated and covered by snow in order to enhance albedo during the spring. And <laughs> Okay, uh, I think that's, that's <laughs> very challenging. To do. Very, uh, I think if you manage it, it, it's, it's, it, will, it will take you a lot of efforts to, to create an ice-free winter. If you do that, then having ice during the summer, I don't think it's possible really because, because the temperatures of, of the ocean, of the Arctic Ocean will be around five degrees, 10 degrees and during the summer. So I guess it's not going to be possible to, to freeze the freeze ice during this during the summer. Yeah. But yeah, it's a possibility maybe. Yeah. Okay, if you have any other question, you can unmute yourself and, and ask uh, 
Julian, and he will be glad to answer. And uh, if not, you can also send it to me or to him uh, after this presentation or after this webinar. Um, we will actually put the recording of the webinar on our website. Uh, you can actually listen to it for those who could not make it. They can actually listen to this uh, 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 recording uh, on our website. And if you don't have any other question, uh, then I guess uh, we will uh, actually end the webinar. Uh, Julien, thank you very much for your time in actually thank preparing the presentation. And yeah, I, you, want you, to I was very surprised that uh, that Spring of Nature Applied Science has accepted this paper. I thought that you know there will be a lot of resistance on a, or even proposing somebody proposing something like this, but you know I. I'm not like, I don't think that this should be done. This is just kind of like, you know, let's see, let's, let's see what happens and stuff. Of course, the main solution for the world is to, is to reduce CO2 emissions, to mitigate, you know, uh, impl implement renewable energies and, and reduce CO2 emissions, have a hydrogen economy is coming. We have batteries, we lower, our impact, we even store the CO2, which we already emitted back into the reservoirs. And yes, but the thing is that you never know what's gonna happen in the future. We should have at least some tools that we can easily and quickly apply so that we can survive, you know, we can improve, enhance our, our world, increase the life in, on Earth and, and things like this. I was very happy that you know the the reviewers understood the proposal here. Yeah, and, uh, I think uh, like a lot of uh, ideas, especially related to geoengineering, always starts up like uh, what what a lot of people from that community or from the science uh, climate science community resisting uh, ideas or this kind of ideas, and before you know, it becomes like a, a mainstream idea. So you never know, like you said, in 10, 20 years, what will happen. This might look like uh, something that is really difficult or evasive, uh, but yeah. uh, maybe in 10, 20 years, it might not be. It might be something that is actually discussed. So thank you very much for, pre for preparing the presentation. And I want to thank all our participants. Uh, is there an additional question? No. No, yeah. So Andrew Locke, he, he, for example, he works on on on. Thanks for for being here, Andrew. He works on proposals for building dams in front of Greenland to reduce sea level rise. And yeah, so this paper that I just presented shows that yeah, this is a great idea, but we, it might contribute to reducing the sea ice cover, increasing the temperature of the Arctic, and having all these impacts that you know, I present in the paper. So, yeah, so it's, it's the, it, I also publish a paper on this. I think it's a great idea, you know, but yeah, whatever thing that we do, it has huge impact. And yeah, we should think and debate on these impacts. Yeah, I think this is the kind of avenue where we can push this debate forward and encourage discussion to share ideas uh, anyway. Thank you very much for your time once again. And I want to thank all our participants as well for uh, joining us. Okay, uh, have a good day. And uh, you can keep an eye on our website for upcoming webinar. And uh, if you find something that's interesting, we are glad to welcome you again. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.